His name is synonymous with corporate titan. He's an innovator. He's an icon. He's in the same category as the J.B. Morgans, the Rockefellers. A pioneer who was instrumental in creating a two and a half trillion dollar industry. Henry Kravitz has constantly pushed the envelope. He's helped define the private equity industry. Henry was ahead of everybody when it came to raising money. He sort of invented the business. Henry Kravitz led a fierce battle that sent shockwaves through Wall Street. Henry's decision to enter the deal as he did. It was not just big guns coming in. It was Godzilla wading in from the ocean and stomping down Wall Street. He's a fighter and a competitive fighter. He not only changed the game, he made it better. Henry was at the forefront of the 80s. You look at Henry today, it's the same story. Henry's right at the top. There was no doubt in my mind that once he said he was going to win that deal, he was going to win. He's making the big decisions, calling the shots. He's been the one instrumental in taking risks over the years and pushing them into, into new areas. Henry Kravis opened up a brand new frontier to investors, amassing a war chest greater than the gross domestic product of many small countries. To this day, he has rarely talked about his work or his life publicly and declined to participate in this program. Kravis was born in 1944 in the oil patch of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Black gold was everywhere. His father was a petroleum engineer who made his family a fortune. Alan Ace Greenberg, former chairman of Bear Stearns, has known Kravis for over 40 years. There wasn't a major institution in this country that would make a loan against gas or oil reserves without speaking to his father first. Brian Burrow is co-author of the landmark financial drama of modern business, the book Barbarians at the Gate. From an early age, he clearly, as a man who had a very successful father, uh, wanted to show that he was every bit as successful as his father was. Kravis's road to success took him from prep school in the Northeast to Southern California in 1963. He majored in economics at Claremont McKenna College. In a recent commencement address to his alma mater, he shared how growing up in the 1960s helped shape the course of his life. It was a decade of tumultuous social, political, economic, and cultural change. I understood that these rapid and disruptive changes could help me look at who I was and who I should become. Kravis returned to the heart of the business world, New York. After an internship picking stocks at a money management firm, his father urged him to go back to school in 1967. He enrolled in Columbia's MBA program, but his focus was elsewhere. He wanted to do deals. He wanted to make big bucks didn't want to stay at Columbia once he got there. It was only when his former boss allowed him to kind of keep his hand in the business in his spare time that Henry said, okay, I'll get the, the cotton picking degree. After college, he jumped on an opportunity presented by his first cousin. George Roberts was an analyst at the trading shop Bear Stearns, but he wanted to move to San Francisco. Henry got his job. Louis Eisenberg is one of their oldest friends. Henry and George are more than close. They uh, can finish each other's sentences most of the time. I've heard them disagree, but they end up coming to virtually the same conclusions, and they both share the same brilliance for his business. Though over 3,000 miles away, the cousins would work on the same team with their boss, a financial visionary, Jerry Colbert. Henry Kravis's timing was amazing in that he lucked into a job with his fair fellow Jerry Kohlberg, who was doing these strange little deals no one had heard of called bootstrap deals, later to be known much better as leverage buyouts. Kohlberg saw opportunity where other investment bankers didn't. Leverage buyout is very simple. It's where a company buys itself. You strip them down of a lot of the excess. You make them lean and mean. You borrow a lot of money against the company's assets. To pay back that money, you generally sell off the assets. He came up with the idea of going after family businesses. People that wanted to retire didn't necessarily want to sell out to their competition. People who were very concerned about the people that worked for them. Their idea started paying off. 
Their acquisition of industrial parts company Incom International for nearly $92 million brought in the largest fee Kravis said Bear Stearns had ever seen, $950,000. Within three years, Kravis ran his own deals and became a Bear Stearns partner at 30 years old. To make an LBO work, you can't have a trace of sentimentality. You have to be able to slash and burn. I would say Henry's skill set was ideally suited for LBOs. He has a very accomplished and cold analytical eye. Henry doesn't think anything of chopping down a CEO who doesn't deliver his numbers. Gone. But an LBO's returns took years, a lifetime in the quick profit culture of Bear Stearns. To say they had no patience with Jerry's deals is like saying that it tends to get hot in Texas in summer. It was a matter of time before things got ugly. Bear Stearns management rejected Kohlberg's demands to start a separate LBO department. The three men quickly decided that their time at the legendary investment bank was over. I felt very bad about it. I've often said that I don't think we worked hard enough to keep them all on. And I must say I've regret, regretted it ever since. I think it was difficult as those kind of moves are, but Henry asks a lot of questions and he asks himself a lot of questions, but there's very little self-doubt uh, on the moves he makes. In 1976, Henry Kravis, his cousin George Roberts, and their mentor Jerry Kohlberg took a huge gamble. In a bitter parting, they left the Wall Street powerhouse Bear Stearns. We're going to start this, uh, our own firm, and we're going to just focus on something that never been done before. It's uh, the time we call the bootstrap acquisition. I really want to do it. I want to do it with George. We're going to go give it a try. Armed only with their novel idea to make money and $400,000 from backers for overhead costs, on May 1st, Wall Street's newest private equity firm, KKR Investments, opened its doors. Kravis had to immediately convince potential investors and LBO targets that he could post big returns. Richard Beatty has been an advisor to Kravis since the early 1970s. Most people would say, what? You, you want to put how much debt on this company? How can you do that? Pointing to his success at Bear Stearns, he convinced investors to give him money. Jim Robinson, former chairman of American Express, has been friends with Kravis for over 30 years. I met this bright young fellow who really uh, was a very smart uh, investment banker who was going into a new direction. That was exciting. A new way of using Wall Street mobilizing capital to go into companies to help build the companies into even stronger better companies everything from the pension world to others who are interested in being limited partners henry and his cousin george hunted for companies with predictable cash flow and potential for growth their approach was to try to work with existing management kravis wanted them on board for a smooth transition john mack is chairman of the board of morgan stanley and has known Henry Kravis for almost 20 years. He's a superb in delivering that speech, that talk, that vision, that story to a board. He comes across as knowing what he's talking about. Extremely professional. Uh, he'll know the facts. And he'll have a vision that he will lay out in front of the board and what he's thinking, why he's thinking, and what the outcome will be. He can be uh, a force to be reckoned with in a deal and you can see his emotion in it. In 1979, KKR made its first major buy, auto parts maker Hudai Industries. At the time, it was the first buyout of a major publicly held company in Wall Street history. But it would be only the first of many for Kravis, Kohlberg, and Roberts. 81, 82, 83 were terrific years. Gave them credibility in the marketplace, gave them credibility with the banks, with the insurance companies. By 1983, KKR's 20% stake in each deal made Kravis a multi-millionaire. That same year, KKR was raising a record-setting investment fund, $1 billion. The innovative fund would come to intimidate their competitors. It was an era later summed up in one famously simple line in the movie Wall Street. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. And it was just getting started. 
1984, credit was easier to come by. High-risk, low-rated junk bonds became the vital engine for their LBOs. Junk bonds, you could get them like that. The importance was the speed. It allowed Henry and George to move on a dime overnight to come up with the financing to make a deal work. As new deals poured in, so did invitations to glamorous New York events. Kravis's second marriage to aspiring fashion designer Caroline Rome catapulted them onto the society pages. The couple often attended black tie events with their good friend, Donald Trump. Henry was a very glamorous figure in those early days. He was a very, very basic guy with a brilliant mind, but he always seemed to be surrounded in glamorous settings. Kravis was now a deep-pocketed pillar of the New York social elite. Henry had no idea what the partnering with Caroline and the, uh, the, the, the appearances in the social columns would, would bring. The world looked and saw a wealthy man. They saw overreaching. And these things became symbolic of the 80s. And Henry became symbolic of the 80s. He hated it, hated it, hated it. By 1985, KKR and Henry Kravis personified the Wall Street boom. The private company was the most successful leveraged buyout firm in the world, managing an investment fund worth $1 billion. With their success came imitators. Competition created an entirely new world uh, for KKR. They could no longer take the time to sit back and smoke a pipe with George, the CEO, up in White Plains. Suddenly, deals had to be done faster. Somebody else would be doing them. For the first time, Henry and George pushed KKR into competitive deals, uh, unfriendly deals. Unfriendly deals like Beatrice Foods, the parent company of some of America's best-known brands. In 1986, they took over the giant conglomerate for $6.2 billion, again setting records on Wall Street. KKR wasted no time in dismantling Beatrice, selling off division by division to pay down the debt. Kravis and his cousin did well. They earned $45 million in fees. Suddenly, with rich fees and rewards, came a split within KKR. Kravis and his mentor, Jerry Kohlberg, were in a battle for the soul of their company. On May 18, 1987, Jerry Kohlberg announced he was leaving KKR. In the press, he hinted at a decline of ethics at his former company, telling the New York Times he would stick with deals where reason still prevails. Jerry's departure was very painful for all three. For everyone, it was a very sad thing when Jerry was basically shunted aside from the business that he'd founded. However, um, when that did happen, it left Henry and George in clear control. Kravis and Roberts were exactly where they wanted to be in clear control, but they swiftly hit a wall of trouble with Beatrice Foods. After stripping most of its assets to pay down the debt, KKR was still saddled with the company's bloated food division. Kravis hungered for a new blockbuster. In 1987, he found the perfect takeover candidate. RJR Nabisco, the cookie and tobacco company, the US's 19th largest public corporation, had a stock price trading in the $40 range and would soon prove to be undervalued. RJR owned two giant businesses. A buyer could sell Nabisco to pay off debt and keep RJR's hugely profitable cigarette brands, Winston and Camel. They have addicted customers, for Christ's sake. They make tons of cash. Everybody wanted to do that deal. And it had a CEO who would listen to just about anything. Ross Johnson was very, very generous to people. He loved to provide an airplane for somebody to go to a golf tournament. Sometimes maybe he did too many things with RGR and Nabisco's assets, but he meant well. F. Ross Johnson needed to boost his company's stagnant stock price after the Black Monday market crash of 1987 and problems with the company's new product. Then there was the smokeless cigarette by R.J. Reynolds, years in the making. It hit the market with an enormous thud. Nothing. Nothing. Going private with an LBO was his chance to revive the company, not to mention make a personal fortune. The stage was set. Henry Kravis wanted in. 
Kravis had approached Johnson with this very idea a year before, but there was a problem. You'd have a hard time finding two corporate executives much different than Henry Kravis and Ross Johnson. Henry is tightly controlled and serious, and Ross comes across as anything but. In terms of personal style, he wears a little necklace, and, you know, he's like Dean Martin. They were destined to come into conflict. Johnson and his management team decided to strike out on their own and partner with Shearson Lehman, an investment bank without KKR's experience in LBOs. On October 20th, 1988, they made a proposal, a $17 billion leveraged buyout of R.J. Reynolds. They were offering $75 a share, a nearly $20 increase over the stock price. Henry Kravis was outraged. The war had begun. He was the king of that business at that point. And there is no denying that he was personally offended that a group of little upstart nobodies to the LBO business could think that they could come into his turf and take the single biggest deal ever proposed. Johnson's group tried to make peace with Kravis, but talks went nowhere. Just four days later, Kravis and KKR shocked the financial world with their own bid, $20 billion, raising the price to $90 a share. Henry's decision to enter the deal, as he did, it was not just big guns coming in. It was Godzilla wading in from the ocean and stomping down Wall Street. He wanted to scare off potential buyers. Jim Robinson was head of American Express, the parent company of Shearson Lehman at the time. I was on the other side of the fence. Henry and George, when they get personally involved in the deals, you know that you're dealing with a very capable adversary. But the RJR board declined KKR's offer. While Johnson and his team were blindsided by Henry Kravis's aggressive move, they didn't back down. They countered with another offer of $92 a share, almost $21 billion. Everything on Wall Street stopped. He was like two gunfighters out in the street and everybody wanted to watch or everybody wanted to grab a gun. The media, they love a battle, they love a war, they love a winner, they love a loser. The round-the-clock publicity and the scrutiny over the largest deal in history stung Kravis. Nobody likes to see their deal negotiated in the press on a daily basis and be taken out of proportion. When you play that game, you're going to get people taking shots at you. You're going to have people attack you. You learn uh, to uh, have a thick skin. The RJR board also rejected Johnson's proposal. Though to move the deal forward, they told all potential bidders that they had 10 days to come up with another offer. The confrontation between the bidders escalated. I think Henry might tell you today that part of what was driving him subconsciously was the desire to win, the single most deadly sin that you can have in the acquisitions business. Six weeks after Johnson's initial offer for the giant company, Kravis and Roberts were locked in a marathon last-minute bidding session. Their final bid was a staggering $109 a share, nearly double its initial price. Now it became a waiting game. There's a lot of tension. And everybody's tired. I remember it was very late at night when the board finally made its decision. It's all over. It's all over? Right. On November 29th, 1988, a few minutes after 10 at night, the board of RJR had made their decision. Henry Kravis would win the day. KKR, the best in the business, and uh, they know what they're doing. Johnson tried to engineer the biggest inside job in history. He would have made at least $100 million for his own personal bank account if the deal had worked. But a Wall Street tycoon named Henry Kravis snatched the company away, and that's it for Mr. Johnson. KKR made $75 million in fees. Clearly, winning RJR took Henry to the pinnacle of his reputation on Wall Street. But more than anything, I, I know from talking with him at the time, that mostly what they felt was fear. A fear that they were not going to be able to make this work. Ultimately, those fears proved well-founded.
KKR were the winners in the epic business battle for RJR Nabisco. But for Henry Kravis, the spoils were short-lived. They ultimately won that prize. Over the long run, it did not turn out as well as one might have hoped. The aftermath of the mega deal was catastrophic. It had not worked out uh, perfectly, and there was a lot of uh, pressure to get this thing right and make a return for their investors. The firm is often congratulated on, on acquiring, making a large acquisition. And he's always said, save it, congratulate me when we get out. In 1991, while trying to take RJR out of its tailspin, Kravis faced a family tragedy. Harrison, his 19-year-old son from a previous marriage, was killed in a car crash. His life hasn't been simple. His personal life has had a strong sense of tragedy. Losing his son, you can try and imagine, but you can't really go there. Two years later, Kravis was splashed all over the tabloids when he divorced his wife of seven years, Carolyn Rome. He remarried Marie-José Drouin, a prominent economist and philanthropist. By 1995, cigarette price wars and tobacco litigation had crushed RJR's profits, generating a dismal annual rate of return of less than 1%. KKR decided it was no longer worth holding on to the corporate giant. They unloaded their investment, and one of Wall Street's most storied battles, the RJR Nabisco buyout, came to a close. You ask whether the RJR deal is Wall Street's finest hour. I don't think anybody would call it its finest hour. I think, if anything, someone argued that it was its worst hour, its lowest hour, its most demeaning hour, an hour when all the things, all the stereotypes that Main Street in America believes about Wall Street, that, that it's doing things for ego and greed, seems so demonstrably true to the rest of the country. After some rocky deals in the 90s, Kravis and KKR struggled. In 2001, one of their holdings, Regal Cinemas, went bankrupt, costing them half a billion dollars. Bloodied but unbowed, Kravis admitted they needed to change the way they did business, and after years of rebuilding, were once again making headlines. In 2006, they bought the hospital chain HCA, valued at $33 billion. Jason Kelly is a private equity reporter at Bloomberg News. KKR beat it with the HCA deal in 2006. Then KKR beat that record with the TXU deal in 2007. So they came back, and they came back fierce. In 2007, they began a three-year effort to list the company on the New York Stock Exchange, finally going public with a disappointing debut in 2010. Going public is an extraordinarily difficult decision for these guys to make. What's uncomfortable for this firm that, that he and George have built over the years is showing any part of the secret sauce to the public. KKR's portfolio includes 58 companies and manages assets totaling over $55 billion. But even that doesn't quite capture the breadth of what they hold. $218 billion in revenue across the companies that they own, from toy retailers to power producers in Texas to hospital chains. Look, there are two types of guys on Wall Street, those that retire to Florida and those that don't. Clearly, one of the things that's most important to him is his legacy. I don't think uh, there's ever the expectation that every ball is going to be hit out of the park. But if there's a place that can hit every ball out of the park, he's developing a team with a deep bench at KKR and they're gonna hit a lot of balls out of the park. If you've got a hope and a belief and a dream, uh, follow it, no matter what. Henry's an absolute pioneer. He's an innovator, he's an icon, like Morgan, like the Rockefellers. Henry's a great guy with an unbelievable instinct for what's going to happen into the future. He can look and just see it better than almost everybody. And that's an awfully good trait when it comes to business.